Yes, flash is better. Okay. Okay. We're going to go down. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. You all can hear, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So if you took everything else away but prophecy, prophecy alone to me would sell me that this is the truth. But it would convince me. That's a better word than say because we're not fine. But it, it convinces because if you can prophetically tell something thousands of years in advance in explicit detail, and hit every single detail exactly. Wow. That's saying something. That's yes. trustworthy and that's worthy of saying, okay, we've got something here. Well, every single prophecy up to this point that was really fulfilled by this point was fulfilled in that kind of detail. We've seen that time and again. The Lord coming in his first coming at the perfect time. He didn't come early. He didn't come late. He came exactly when. He came where God said he would be born. He wasn't there because that's where his family was. His family, on the contrary, was north in Nazareth, but they were brought down to Bethlehem, the Bethlehem, the place where he would be born, at the very time that Mary would give birth. Not ahead and not late at the very time. I could go through prophecy after prophecy after prophecy and point to this and tying it into our prophetic timeline here. We saw with the book of Daniel, Daniel, we saw it, the history was so specific. I think it's in chapter 5, if I remember, that people said, oh, no, Daniel could not have written this book ahead. This has to be a historian. He took it from history. Nobody could get every detail like this right. And then they found the documents that were proven to predate the battles that he had given so specifically. So there was no choice but to say he spoke prophetically. And of course we know Yeshua, Jesus, gave his stamp of approval, calling Daniel not the historian, but Daniel the prophet. He forth told in every single detail. Every prophet, every prophecy we touch on comes exactly like that. And we will see all the rest fulfilled also. But that is why we can stand on the word of God as believers and know that we know that we know. And what do we know? How awesome is our God and his plan through the ages that will not be thwarted. So that kings come up and kings go down and countries change and move and do and have their being thinking they're doing their plan and God must chuckle because they're just falling right into his prophetic plan. That's why I tell you, open up that Bible, open up the news, Newspaper, read them, one in each hand, and you will see the shape of the countries coming together for what we see coming soon. Why I say, I think it will be soon. And we're going to keep looking at that because as we go on, remember now, the harlot was uh, Mystery Babylon, chapter 17, especially verse 5, calls her that. The, the harlot was called Mystery Babylon, and she presented herself as a bride. She was... In essence, she and the Antichrist were hand in hand, but we're going to see now in verse 7, and this is where it gets exciting again, we're going to see the true bride is revealed. We're going to see that Satan has his false bride because what does he do? Counterfeit. That's all he can do. There's not one creative thought in his entire being. It's not one thing he has initiated. All he's done is counterfeit. And he takes just enough of the truth to make the lie go down for those who are not aware and standing on the truth. So that's why we need to study and know the word of God so that we don't fall into any of the deception. Not that you can lose your salvation. You'll see very clearly it is not that. But you can be led down a path and not be following and it being obedient to the Lord God. And that's, for him, that's a win. And we're not going to give him that. So verse 7, our true bride will be revealed. I believe this is also why the hallelujahs are going up because the false has been put under and done away with. And now in verse 7, let us rejoice. Let us be glad. Let us give the glory to him. And him, of course, we know the one we've been talking about, the one Lord God Almighty that we just mentioned in verse 6. And now why is the reason for rejoicing, be glad, and giving glory? Because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And remember last week I set you up and said, we get it backwards. When we have a, a marriage ceremony here, it's all about the bride. The bride is the most important. 
down here. We had, we make the whole day around her. But what's more important is the lamb. It's the marriage supper of the lamb, not the marriage supper of the bride. It's the marriage supper of the lamb. He is the one that should get our focus. And it says here, for the marriage of the lamb, one version says has come. If you get into the Greek, the Greek literally says is come. And the tense that is conveying is the time has now arrived. I love that. It's arrived. It's here. You're waiting for it, waiting for it, waiting for it. It's here. The time has arrived. The marriage supper of the Lamb is about to, to be on the scene. Uh, and it is come. The bride has made herself ready. We'll look at how she's made herself ready. But let me, let me make clear, okay, the heart has been destroyed. I think I brought that out. Um, and let me bring you back up to verse 2. The, uh, for he has judged the great harlot, okay? Remember, the false bride is going away. The true bride is coming on the scene. And again, in the Greek, it's an aorist tense. So here it's saying that that judgment is complete. That's an event as if it's already happened is the way it's being seen in the Greek. So even though we know it is future, it is being written here as it's, it is done. It can be written that way because God's word is as good as done. If he says it, believe it. It will be. So we have the destruction, the judgment of the, the, uh, of the false bride completed in the past. And we will not even have mention of her as we move forward. Notice, though, the beast is not mentioned. It's just the destruction of this false bride, just the destruction of Mystery Babylon. Why? Because we're going to see that the beast, who is even more of a monster than, than the harlot was, is still going to be dealt with. He is still working his evil on the face of the earth. His time of judgment has not come quite yet but he is about to be destroyed. So hang on. When you want to see it, you're watching that movie, and you want to see that evil dealt with, that's where we're at. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And we'll let out another hallelujah when that comes. That he will be destroyed at the time that Messiah returns. So we've got to get just a little bit further in here, and we will see it. But remember, we're looking as if this is done. So we see that we have a marriage. We have the marriage of the Lamb that has come. Now, the first Adam was given a, a wife. He was presented a wife. That wife was created from part of him. The story of Adam and Eve. You know the story well. That God created man, showed man that he needed someone in his loneliness. He puts Adam to sleep, and out of his side, he makes himself a bride for Adam, so to speak. And when we go to the scripture, to 1 Corinthians, and we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15.45, we see a reference to the first Adam and to a second Adam. I believe it says it in there. If not, the thought is there, and we'll be able to bring it out anyway. So 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45. And we read it there. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. This is when God breathed into Adam. He was made out of the clay of the earth. He became alive and God breathed into him. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. It is Yeshua Jesus who gives the spirit. Remember he even said he would send back into heaven and the spirit would come. So it is through him who, and, and God, the spirit, and the son are all one. We, we know that also, but the last Adam then, uh, what it is pointing out here, because it's not saying it completely, it's probably in the verses around it, but to redeem mankind, it had to be a man. It couldn't be some robot or, you know, Star Wars or whatever. It had to be man to redeem man. It had to be someone who could come into our realm, into our world, deal with our consequences of our sin. So Yeshua stepped into our world, slipped into time and space, put on a face. We call him Yeshua, Jesus. And that is where he entered into the human part. Remember Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born. Here's your baby. The child is born, but the son is given. Because the son of God predates time. The son of God being a messianic title goes all the way back. The son never was born. 
The Son is not less than God. The Son is equal to God. But he had to take on human form to rescue human nature. He did not take on angelic form to rescue the angels who fell. I believe because they were in the very presence of God when they sinned that God did not even have a spark of mercy for them. But rightfully just judgment on them. But for mankind, in his heart of hearts, in the fact that he is a God of love, he bent down to reach his creation. And when we separated ourselves from our eternal creator forever, if it had stayed that way, he stepped in and brought the only solution that could come, perfect, sinless blood to take the place of the blood of bulls and goats, the blood of the lambs that had been pointing to him. Those could only cover sin. Now the perfect atoning um, propitiation, the blood of the Lord Yeshua, was placed on the altar, I believe literally, the mercy seat in heaven, opening up heaven for us so that we can go and be in the presence of our God through that shed blood. That's worthy of a hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that is what is being referred to here. He became man, but he was always God-man. Fully God, fully man. Do we understand? No. Do we take it by faith? Yes. yes. Are you sitting in a chair right now? Yes. yes. Did you take it by faith that chair would hold you up? <laughs> yes. 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 So it is not far-fetched faith. It is a faith that's based on a reality that what God says, he is true to his word and he will do. And by faith, we believe what has been said and we believe that he coming into human form could still remain God. And if God could be on our level where I could understand, then, world, you're in trouble. <laughs> I've got no answers for this world. I'm not good enough. I don't have a powerful enough brain to handle what is needed. I don't want a God on my level. I want a God that blows my mind yes. every time I turn around. Yes. And does he not, from his creation to his inception, from the great... I am of all time to the one who could step in at a specific moment in time, become like us, become the second Adam, and then take away the sting that was brought to us by the first Adam. First Adam brought us death. Second Adam brings us life. That's what is being said here. This last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Whoa, yes, hallelujah, I love it. Somebody keeps me going. <laughs> and I love it. And it's our Messiah who's going to return for his bride. That's what we're going to be looking at in just a moment. But um, as I was saying, um, a wife was presented to the first Adam, a wife is presented to the second Adam. That's what we're going to be talking about here. And it was created um, from him also because... The Lord is creation of all. Let me just take you to Ephesians 5 real quickly before we go back to Revelation. Remember, we like to see it fully in, in a complete book called the Bible because it's one book even though we divide it up. Ephesians 5, 30 and 32. And this is where just ahead of this is where Shaul Paul is teaching the husband and wife is a picture of the Lord and the church and he's telling about that kind of love and he tells us that the church that we are his bride he says in verse 30 because we are members of his body Christ is our head we make up his body and we see that also in verse 32 the mystery is great but I am speaking to oh Paul I am speaking with reference to Messiah or to Christ and the church. So that husband-wife relationship shows us the relationship of Yeshua to the church that is now called the Bride of Christ, that we are his bride or the bride of Messiah. So we see that's not a foreign thought that was given to us in Scripture. And let me bring you just slightly, not going into any huge detail, but there's um, three stages to what's called an Oriental mar marriage. And the Oriental just simply means the times in the east where in Israel and that area that were um, the way it was at that time. 
Because what we see is we see the Lord use what was around them to explain spiritual lessons sometimes. So when we look at the three stages of that type of marriage, we see that there would be a betrothal. The betrothal would be when the father picked a bride for the son. Interesting, isn't it? How many sons want their dads picking out their wives nowadays? <laughs> Not too many, I know. But this was the uh, this was the way it was, and the way to become uh, that they're going to be able to become the bride to Messiah is going to be through salvation. That's the, what the marriage is: is through salvation. What am I trying to say? Look at Yohanan John, chapter six. And I don't think this one's in your cross-references. I think I added this in. So you may want to write that down. Uh, John chapter 6. I don't know if I got 6. I did. Okay. And then look at verse 37. See, every time I study, I get more and more and more. So we got to count in. We have Yeshua Jesus talking. He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. The one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Here is where we see the Father is his will. He's come down to do the will of him who, who would send him. This is the will of him who sent me. And of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up in the last day. Um, there's another place, I thought it was here also, where it says that all the Father has given me, I've not lost one. Mm -hmm. So we know it's talking about people. It's also in Yohanan John. I'll get you the reference later. Let's go on the heels of this to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. That is in your cross-references in verse 2. And there we read also, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband so that to Messiah I may present you as a pure virgin. Now that's Sha'ol Paul speaking to his followers that, that have uh, come to saving faith. But what he's speaking is the same message that we're getting from God, that God, we're betrothed to Yeshua, Jesus, because God did it all. He called us and he made the way available through Jesus. And when you're presented as a chaste virgin, what that means is impurity. Now that's going to be key because we're going to see how does this bride become pure. First we have the betrothal and we see that the father is chosen. And then we have the coming of the bridegroom for his bride. Okay, he's going to take her home because that's the way they did it then. The bridegroom, and, and I have to back up for a moment, but right now the bridegroom is going to, after the father has chosen a bride and there's been an acceptance, then the groom goes home, builds a place for the wife. And when the father believes that it's good enough, ready, then the father tells the son, go get your bride. And the bride comes and moves into the home of the groom. We don't do it that way today. Often it goes the other way, but that's the way it was back then. But let me back you up now and tell you that at that betrothal, when there's been that acceptance, and that's for us, that would be when we open up our hearts to accept the Lord Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, as our Savior, then the, the covenant is made at that point. The, they come into an agreement. And as I've taught you before, in biblical time, the betrothal was as standing as what after the ceremony. If you wanted to break the betrothal, you had to get a bill of divorcement. You had to split. You had to divorce. It was considered done even though it would yet be carried out. We are considered his bride now, even though we haven't been taken to his home yet. That's coming, but we are already his bride. And he does not give a bill of divorcement. Sorry, folks, but no, I'm not sorry. He does not. <laughs> you know, I don't want one either. <laughs> and I'm glad he'll never want one because he sees me through that shed blood. Doesn't give me freedom to go live how I want. No, I want to please my groom. I want to please him. I want to please the lamb. But there's nothing that's going to separate. But I love this part. In that betrothal, the groom provides for the bride's needs. If there's something she needs, he provides. Doesn't wait till the marriage. It's already in the betrothal. Let me take you to Ephesians. Back up, or no, if we were in Corinthians, so just right around the corner, go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And we read, In him, 
in Yeshua. You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. So, who's Shaul Paul talking to? The believers, okay? In the believers in Yeshua, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Interesting, isn't it? Who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. What's that saying? You're sealed by the Spirit until you're home with your group. It's the promise, and it's the promise that will never be broken. You are sealed with it the same way the king would put a seal, and that seal could not be broken. Remember, even when uh, the king, and this is a, an earthly king, but in Daniel's day, when the decree went out that if you prayed to any other god, you did anything to any other god, you would be thrown into the lion's den. The king signs it thinking this is a great decree and then realizes what trap he had fallen into. He could not change it. He could not rescind his role. His seal had gone on it. It was sealed. Well, that's what we're seeing here in that seal. It is sealed by the Spirit of God. This is why I am so strong, loud and long, on your eternal security. Amen. You are sealed at the moment of acceptance forever. You will get the results of that sealing one day. We are not home yet, but we know where home is. We are not earthly dwellers. Remember when we separated that in Revelation 3? The earth dwellers, where is our citizenship? Heaven. Of heaven. We are citizens of heaven. That is our home. That is where we belong. And although we have never set foot there, it is home. Amen. And we get to go. Maybe before this class ends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here you are. are we listening? You know, we're not looking for signs. We're listening for sounds. Remember the sound of that shofar that's going to blow that blow. But I loved seeing this. That that when I studied and learned that the groom is providing ahead of time. That's where we're at. Do you have a need? Ask your groom. Amen. Ask your group, he'll send you out the need, and it will come through the Spirit of God to you. Well, I have yeah. my side notes, I'm sorry. Yes, no, go ahead. Um, chapter 13 through 15 is our down payment on heaven. Yes, and you mean verses 13 uh, and 15, it is. And in actuality, I'm glad you reminded me to bring it out. When it talks about being sealed with the Holy Spirit, the Greek, the way it's used, is like the engagement ring that seals the engagement. And it is the down payment. It is, here's, here's the promise. Here's the ring. Here's the promise. Now you'll get everything else after. Well, during the time that uh, this betrothal has taken place, and the betrothal in the Hebrew is irisin. It's a hard word to say, but in case if you hear it sometime, now there's what's called the kiddushin. Now, those of you who've been with me on Saturdays, remember the kiddush, where we come together and we share the bread and the, the juice or the wine. Picture of the bread of life and the fruit of the vine, who is Yeshua. All picture of Yeshua, all picture of his provision for us. When you eat from him, you don't hunger. And all that you need... The vine is, you know, he's the vine, we're the branches. You have to have the vine to survive. All of that is in there. Well, the time given to this is the minimum of a year. So the bride-to-be, the one who knows she's going to go move to her groom's home, knows it's going to be at least a year. During that year, she is to prepare herself. She learns how to be a good bride. She learns how to be a good wife. She learns everything that she needs to be learning. She's preparing herself. And at the same time, remember, the groom is preparing a place for his bride. <laughs> One day it will be heavenly. Remember how loud it was from heaven? That it was heard all over? It wasn't quiet like that, Tony. But I see Yeshua telling us he's preparing the place for us. It's already been a year, so he can come any time. We don't have to wait. It's already been a year. But during this time also, the, the bride will go to a, a mikvah. A mikvah is a ceremonial bathing. Some people try to compare it to baptism, but it's really not. And I want to bring you out the difference because 
she is going to be presented pure to her groom from coming through this nikapa, from coming through um, this washing. But the male also goes through a nikapa, and that's why I, I don't want you to see it as baptism because Yeshua has nothing that he needs to be baptized for. He is not the mikva, M-I-K-V-A, and usually they put an H on the end. M-I-K-V-A-H, Hebrew word. The mikvah. And it, it will be, it can be small, but it's enough depth that they'll go down steps, the water will go over them, and they'll come up on the other side. They have new clothes waiting for them on this side. They've just robed on this side so that they come through in a ceremony that shows them as pure. And why I stress this is Yeshua had nothing that was not pure that he needed to be cleansed for. And when he's baptized, remember he is baptized by Yochanan, who says, I'm not even worthy to undo your, your sandal. What are you doing here? He tells them to, to, to go ahead and baptize him because it was for a different reason. Do you remember what I brought out before when I've taught this? Okay. <clears throat> he is about to step into his role in ministry. When the high priest steps into that role, he goes through the mikvah. He goes through a ceremonial showing that he is made pure to step into that role. Now Yeshua used the earthly just to show what had already taken place in him. He was ready, but to step into the role of the highest priest after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aharon, the earthly order, but after the order of Melchizedek, he is showing that he is pure, he is holy, and he is now stepping into the role of high priest for the people. He had to step in the role of high priest to bring us our salvation because a high priest is the one who will present that blood on the mercy seat to the Father. So Yeshua is not cleansing himself. He's showing he's stepping into that role, but for the woman, she is stepping in and she will be purified by washing by washing by the word of God. Uh, Roger, can we get a little heat to it at the same time? Go to Ephesians chapter 5. You're already in Ephesians, just go to chapter 5. And start with verse 26. Ephesians 5 and 26 to get this thought. So you see how it's not me bringing it out. It's the word of God. And uh, again, this is in the husband loving the wife like the Messiah loves his bride, the church. And we have in verse 26, so that he, Yeshua, might sanctify her, having cleansed her. How did he cleanse her? By the washing of the water with the word. Okay, what's the word? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. So we are washed in Yeshua. We are washed in his blood and we come out pure white. We come out clean. That's what this is a picture of here. This mikvah that, that would be going through the ceremony that would happen. The groom has made the place ready. The father says it's going to be a reflection on my name because he's going to bring his bride home to my house. We're joining, we're coming to the groom's home who is in the home of his father. We see Jehovah, wow. God the Father in heaven. We see Yeshua going after his bride. And because it's reflecting on the Father's home, the Father's making sure that it's ready, that it will be a good reflection of his name. Now we know Yeshua is not in an in-between state, but that's where we bring it down into our earthly level to understand that part. But he did say, I go to prepare a place for you. So we know he is in some way preparing to bring us home to be with him. That year has passed. That place is ready. Father says, son, go get your bride. I hear a trumpet. Tony, where are you? <laughs> I hear the shofar now. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't uh, plan this ahead. Yes, synchronize. That's the word I wanted. Usually there it comes. Usually it was at evening time. There's nothing I can do with that because if it's evening here, it's going to be morning somewhere else, and there are believers all across the world. So some of us will be 
raptured at night, sometimes it'll be raptured in the daytime. So can't give you anything that makes it fit, just telling you what was uh, the, the norm then. And by the way, you saw it reflected in Fiddle on the Roof. If you saw the wedding, you'd notice it was at night that they had the procession. Yeah. So the shofar blows. The bride had to be ready, by the way. She had to always be ready. And we are ready because we are in Yeshua. That's how we are ready. And then the groom would come all the way to the bride's home, get her, and bring her back with him. And it's said that she was never allowed to walk. She was always carried in some way. So it wasn't under her power. It was under his power. Interesting, isn't it? The bride returns, or doesn't return, I'm sorry, goes to the groom's home. The marriage is consummated. The feast is given. Now, we know that the marriage really has taken place. Remember how we look at our Greek, and sometimes we get that aorist tense that says it's already taken place. We were married when we got sealed with that Holy Spirit who came in the moment we opened our heart up to the Lord. We're just waiting to be carried home, not under our own power, to his home, which is in his father's home, where he is going to have that, at least the judgment seat of, of Christ, as it is called, because we're going to see we have our rewards, because we're going to see we're dressed appropriately. The bride has her gown on, and that gown is our, our reward for our righteousness in Yeshua. So that has taken place, and then the groom comes out with his bride and presents her marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what's coming. So, by this, I'm one who tends to believe that the marriage supper probably is in the very beginning of the millennium here on earth. But, there are those who believe that it's in heaven and takes place completely in heaven. And then the bride and groom come back after the marriage supper. If you are one that believes that way, I have no argument. It just seems to me a little more likely on earth because of other, that, that we'll keep drawing in. But, there's room for both. Doesn't matter. It's happened. I'm married. The feast comes later. <laughs> it's all that matters. So as a side note, I hope that that uh, blesses you. I want to make sure I give you everything. I didn't give you everything. Um, is that the same as Ketubah? The Ketubah is the contract that they signed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another Hebrew word. Um, if I took you, and because of time, I'm going to let you read it on your own because I also don't want to confuse. But Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, talks about the ten virgins. They're waiting for the, the bridegroom. Five are ready, five aren't. He comes and gets them. He takes them. And then the ones who weren't ready try to get in. In essence, that is a picture of what we're talking about. But where it falls apart is that's talking millennial. That's not talking for the believer. Because remember, we don't have the church in Matthew. It, the, the Gospels are to Israel. There wasn't a church yet. And when we go through Matthew 24, we see the all the way through in order of the tribulation. It culminates in the Millennial Kingdom, which we see who's going to go into that Millennial Kingdom. Five will, five won't. We'll talk about that when we get to the Millennial Kingdom. So you can look at it just to get an idea of the procession that I'm talking about. But don't put yourself into that timing because you're not there. Okay? Um, let's see. And I did, I think, bring out clearly that the Lamb is the one that's important. It's the marriage of the Lamb. That's the one where our emphasis goes. Okay. And I think I brought out to you the metaphor of the wife and the bride um, with the church. Is that clear to everybody from Ephesians? Okay. So when... when the instructions are given that the husband is to love his wife like Messiah loves the church. There's your comparison. And how did he love the church? He loved the church enough to lay down his life and die for his wife. So if a husband will treat his wife in that way, he'll have no problem with a wife who's willingly under him not to be subjected and under the foot, but to have the shield of protection that's providing for him loving him in that way. Perfect balance when you see it. There are three metaphors of women in the book of Revelation that we have seen now. The women in chapter 12 we saw was Israel. The harlot in chapter 17 we saw is false religion. And now the bride in chapter 19 which is the church. 
So it's not always the same as my point there. Don't think a woman has to be the same in every chapter and every time you read about a woman because you'll get yourself totally confused. It will not fit. Now, the false bride is judged and the true bride comes into view. I need to stress to you very clearly, Israel is not the bride. Okay, we have to keep that separate. Okay? We're going to see that Israel has certain promises and the God's plan with Israel. The church certain promises in God's plan with the church. Now, having said that, I have to tell you, there is a teaching out there called dual covenant theology. And if you know that, you're thinking, uh-oh, is that what she's starting to teach? No. no. <laughs> and that's why I want to make sure it's very clear. Dual covenant theology teaches that there's two different ways for salvation. That God saves the Jews one way. In fact, the Jews are just saved because they're Jews and all Israel will be saved. And God saves the church through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. And that is a lie out of the pit of hell. And I'll say it that strongly because that keeps people from telling my Jewish brethren that they need to be saved. They need to hear it the same as every Gentile needs to hear it. And every single individual has to come to that saving knowledge for themselves believe and accept. Open up their hearts and accept. It's not enough just to believe, because even the demons believe who Jesus is. But they have to believe that He is their Messiah. He is their Savior. He died for them. He resurrected for them. And it's His power that can save them. They have to believe that, whether they're Jewish or Gentile, male or female, rich or poor, slave or free, doesn't matter. It is across the board. One name under heaven, whereby Man is saved, and that name is, in Hebrew, Yeshua, in English, Jesus, but we're talking about one and the same. Not too different, okay? So you know where I stand, and I did that especially because, bless your heart, i got somebody new, and I don't want you to go away thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> I want you to know what I believe on the Word of God. It's also important, as I said, though, because people will go off away from Israel and not be a witness to Israel because of this. So let me bring it out clear. Israel is not the bride. The high priest, we saw that the high priest is a type of Yeshua. Remember how I just brought out when he went through his baptism, he was stepping into the role of high priest. We know he's high priest. We know he's the one that presents the sinless blood on the mercy seat. We know he's the one that procures our way of salvation. All that we're good on and we know. Well, the high priest is forbidden to marry a divorced woman or a widow or a harlot. And now I'm going to show you how Israel's compared to all three. So we've got a major problem if the high priest is, needs to be married to Israel. It's going to fall apart right here. Let me take you first to Leviticus, Viacra, Leviticus chapter 21 and verse 10. We'll start there. Leviticus 21 and verse 10. And we read in Leviticus 21.10, and this is under law. It's the time to Israel. Remember, there is no church yet. There is no church until after Yeshua has come to earth, born, grew up, dies on the cross, buried, resurrected, and goes back up into heaven 40 days later. Then, 10 days after that, comes the real Hakodesh, the Holy Spirit, which is the beginning of the church the beginning when the, the power of God came on them in, in the form, well, through the Holy Spirit, who empowered them. They suddenly could speak in a language they had not studied, and notice it was languages that were known, and it was to carry the gospel truth out. And it was so powerful, it was as if the wind had gone rushing through, and we know that in Scripture, the wind is a picture of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. You can't see where, how, and you see the effects of the wind, but you don't see the wind. We don't see the Holy Spirit, but we see his effects. Okay? So, having said all that, back to the high priest who cannot be married to a divorced woman, a harlot, or a widow. Leviticus 21.10, under law, says, Cohen. The Cohen, yes. Yes, if you have the complete Jewish Bible, Cohen is the word for priest. It's why we know today anyone with the last name of Cohen is of the priestly tribe, of the Levitical tribe where the priest came from. If you're, if you're a Cohen or a Levi, you, in your great, 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 great somewhere ancestors, you've got priests. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, verse 10. The priest, the Cohen, who is the highest among his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil has been poured, 
who has been consecrated to wear the garments shall not uncover his head or tear his clothes. This is all what we know even still in Judaism today. They keep their heads covered, and the priests are not supposed to tear their clothes in mourning. Now, they are, they, well, I'll come back to that point. I don't want to sidetrack right now. Maybe I will, because I'll forget. Hold on to right there. Let me go with my other tablet here. Let me go to Matthew. Just listen. It's only going to be one verse. It's Matthew 26 and Matthew chapter 26. There we go. And I think it's verse 65. It is verse 65. Okay, this is when they've got Yeshua Jesus on trial. And remember, they broke many, many rules with his trial all the way through. At this point, verse 65, it says, At this, the Kohen Haggadah, that's the high priest, tore his robes and cried out, Blasphemy, he said. Why do we still need witnesses? You heard him blaspheme. What did he blaspheme? He just claimed to be the Son of God. He just made it very clear. The Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father and coming on the clouds of heaven, which we know all to be true. The high priest heard that. He caught it. When people say, oh, the Lord never claimed to be God, oh, yes, he did. Time and again in the Gospels, he claimed who he was. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I've come to do the will of the Father, the Father who sent me, he and I are one. It's time and time again that he claims it. Well, here the high priest caught it. He got it. And he considered it such blasphemy that he tore his clothes. Even though as high priest, he shouldn't have done that. So that's why I bring that out. Now, back to this, okay? They had certain rules that they weren't supposed to do. Um, and then verse 11, nor shall he approach any dead person and defile himself even for his father or mother. Where am I trying to get? 13 and 14. Sorry. Let me read 13. This high priest, he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman or one who is profaned by harlotry. These he may not take, but rather he is to marry a virgin of his own people. Okay, the high priest in Judaism to this day, we don't have high priests, but the, the rabbis are allowed to marry. We know other religions where they are not. But in <coughs> Bible times, for the high priest, who is the representative of God, and he is not the Pope, don't go there because the Pope is not God, okay? But for the high priest, he was to marry someone who was a virgin, who had not been married, had not been involved in harlotry, and had not been divorced. If she was, she was disqualified. He had to stay to a higher standard because of his office of representation. So it's just a fact. It's just what God said. Here's the law. You want to be obedient? Obey the law. So Israel, if she is divorced, if she is uh, widowed, or if she is a harlot, cannot be Jehovah God's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, can't be Jesus's, the high priest, Jesus, Yeshua, cannot be his bride. Okay, I almost blew that one, so that's important. <laughs> Let's see why as I come to it. I'm thinking ahead of my brain. Jeremiah, year me. Oops, 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 I'm still on bitter on me. <clears throat> okay. All right, we're going to go to year me and Jeremiah, and we're going to go to chapter 3. I'm trying to get back. There we go. Now I can get to the right book. And um, did we get that heat going at all? Because if I'm cold teaching, I think I got people out there cold, Roger. It won't go up any higher. Oh, okay. Sorry, folks. We'll see what we can do next uh, um, Plus. week then to make it a little more comfortable. <laughs> that weather change has gotten us again. Verse. Jeremiah 3, we're going to look at verse 8, and then we'll look at verse 14. Verse 8 says, And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah, Judah did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. So God's speaking about Israel, the ten northern tribes, and he's saying that, that she was, uh, uh, what did he say right in the beginning? Uh, harlot. Yes, he called her, I saw uh, adulteries. Adulteries of faithless Israel. Okay, then he says, Judah, the ten, the, I mean, sorry, the two southern tribes, rather than watching Sister Israel and saying, wow, I see that she's gone into adultery and I see her go into judgment, into captivity for it, so I think I'm going to be smart and not follow that example. No, it's saying she did the same thing and she's a harlot, okay? So here we've got Israel, 
being called a harlot and an adulteress, okay? Both right there in Jeremiah uh, 3, 8 and 14. How about being a widow? Go to Lamentations. The book of Lamentations, which follows, by the way, if you don't know your scriptures, it follows right after um, Jeremiah. It's written by the same author. It's a book of lament. And we read in the very first verse, How lonely sits the city that was full of people. She has become like a widow, who was once great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a forced laborer. Well, who's lamenting? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. He was a prophet to Israel. He had been warning Israel, if you don't turn from your sin, if you don't turn from your wicked ways, you're going to go into captivity. You're going to be judged. You're going to be cast out of the land. You know what they did with him? Threw him in prison. Threw him in the pit. In, in today's vernacular, shut up, Jeremiah, I don't want to hear you, okay? That's rude, but I want you to see they were rude. Here was the mouthpiece of God, and they silenced him. He still cried out, but because they did not heed, and not just your men, but the prophets before him also, they went off into captivity, and they're considered from this picture, in verse 1, a widow. So Israel is called a widow. Israel is called a harlot. Israel is called an adulterer, adulteress. So we see that she disqualifies herself. Because of time again, I'm going to let you look up Isaiah 54.4 on your own, but I want you to see more than one prophet called her by the name of widow. And Hosea, his whole life was God telling him, go back to your wife, the harlot. And it was a picture of God who would not reject his wife forever, even though she was unfaithful to him. Israel is pictured as the wife of Jehovah, the wife of God the Father where the church is the bride of Christ. You have Israel as a wife of Jehovah. And that's why the picture of Hosea is so important because God's showing, even though I send you into captivity, even though you're called what you are, and even looked at as a widow because I have to turn my back on you and allow you to suffer the consequences. Remember the opposite of the groom who's been able to provide for his bride? He has to take off that, that hand of protection and provision and allow her to suffer the consequences of her own actions so that she might awaken and come back to her God. And that's Israel's history. Bless Israel, I love her, but she's not got a good history to this day. She's still doing the same thing. She's back in the land because God is faithful to his word and said, A nation will be born in a day, and he fulfilled Yeshua Isaiah 66 and put Israel in the land. But is she a people who, Jehovah is her God? No, no. I, I'm sorry to say, but no, I love Israel. I want to take you on a tour of Israel. I want to show you the Bible of Israel, or Israel of the Bible, excuse me. But if you see the people, you're going to see a very European people, a very worldly people who have standards that are below the level that they should be. You have even, and it's causing the Orthodox Jew who wants to be more right by God, you're causing him great distress because you even have the gay and lesbian parade that wants to not just be in Tel Aviv, but wants to be in Jerusalem, where Jerusalem is known to be more of the place of worship. Tel Aviv, you play, um, hide that you work, in Jerusalem you pray. That's the way they divide up the land, just in quotes. But that's evil. That's just nothing but evil because we know that's an abomination to the Lord and we want to spread it down the streets of Israel. When you go to Israel, you will see a very modern Israel. You will see that they, they're, they're, they're on the latest cutting edge of all kinds. They have the skyscrapers. They have you know the, the malls. They have the progress. What they have not progressed in is their spiritual state. And that's the sad. You know, there are those in the land with the Word of God who are there trying to share and bring others to the truth. They are the ones who are still, and, and at least prophets in, for, in foretelling, not necessarily foretelling. Okay, there are some that God sells, gives a message to, but what I'm saying is they're there preaching the truth that is already there. I give you the, the rabbi that my dad had the joy of leading to his Messiah. He had lived in Israel. He had lived there many years, I don't remember, but he had fought in 56, 
67, and, and I think there was a third war that he fought in. I think it was 48. I think he was there fighting when Israel became a nation. Anyway, he had spent many years in Israel. He was living in the States. He got saved, long story short, when he went back to Israel with us on tour. He kept saying, I didn't know this was here. I didn't know this was here. He had never seen the sites that opened up the Word of God. And he had his first communion at the garden tomb. That was a beautiful moment. But the testimony is there. The Word is there. The truth is there. But it's Ezekiel 37. They are dry bones. What does that mean? The Spirit isn't in them. And that's what you've got. You've got 8 out of 10 Jewish people don't even want to bother to worship. Then you have 1% that makes up the Orthodox, and you have another percent that makes up the, all the rest that are in one stage or another of Judaism or something else. You don't have a people whose heart is for the Lord yet. We know that during the tribulation time, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It is God bringing them again to awaken to the fact they need to cry out to their God for his protection, for his salvation, for his safety. He has never neglected them. They have brought on themselves the consequences that they're enduring. And notice also the tribulation is not just aimed at Israel, is it? It is on the whole face of the earth. Sin is being judged. Israel is part also of sin being judged. Because there are those who say, you know, how could a loving God treat Israel like that? No, it's how could Israel treat her loving God like that? How can we also, Gentiles, even believers, when we are in rebellion, how can we treat our God like that? We're no better. And when you look at the church, it hasn't been any better either, folks. It's got a lot to regret in its past history also. But again, the point being that, that God never turned his back on Israel. And he won't. He promised that as long as you see sun, moon, and stars, you will know that there is not an end of Israel. There will be an end of other nations, but there will not be an end of Israel. God is faithful. His love is unconditional. We who are part of the body of Yeshua, of his bride, have also that saying, once we are in the family, we are in for good. That means that we may need to be straightened out, we may need to be corrected, but we are always His. That's the way it's the same. Salvation is the same. It's the same name. It is one way. And that's why we don't buy into dual covenant theology. But do we see that God has made specific promises to Israel? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. He's promised her that He's going to sit on the throne of David on earth. We know he's sitting on the throne in heaven, but he has promised he's going to reign on earth, that he will fill that seat. He's promised David to be raised up and sit on that seat. We're going to look at that in chapter 20. We're going to see it in the coming millennium. We're going to see many promises that God has given to Israel. And he said it was an unconditional covenant. It was based on God's faithfulness, not man's. Now, we see promises given to the church. Our promises are different. Are we promised the earth? Are we promised the land called Israel? Are we promised the throne on earth? No. We're promised heaven. We're promised that's our home. That's our eternal home. We're going to see the new Jerusalem. The one that hovers over the earth is our headquarters. We're going to see that in chapter 21. So even if you think I'm not moving forward, I'm actually getting you to ready for the end of the book. The best. <laughs> he keeps his word to the church. He keeps his word to Israel. There are two different programs. There are two different plans. But there's one main program that encompasses both. So where I'm saying there's, there's individuality, it'd be like in your house. You've got a, a let's see if this works. You've got a, a son and you've got a daughter. So you've got two different ones and you do different things with those two. But they're both your children. They're both loved equally. And you're going to be faithful to both of them. Okay, that's what we're seeing. So God will keep his word faithfully. And he and Yeshua Jesus are one and the same. So if I'm saying God, I mean Yeshua Jesus. Jesus keeps his word. God keeps his word. They both are faithful. And they complete the promises. So we are promised.
heaven for our home. We are promised to come back and rule and reign with Yeshua when he sits on that earthly throne for a thousand years. But then we're going to go off into an eternity also. There's a whole lot more. Yeah. Hallelujah. There's a whole lot more coming, and I can't wait. Can I question? Yes. How about Messianic Jews? So they're bride of Jehovah also and bride of Christ? When we talk about the wife of Jehovah, we're talking about Israel. Um, how would I say it? Israel is a whole. Um, we're not talking about an individual because we're talking about a you know a, a time that that moves on through. I am a messianic because I believe in Messiah. He is my savior. He is my salvation. So you're talking about me. I am part of the bride. I'm sorry. Yeah, the part of the bride that's married to Yeshua, that's waiting to be taken to his home. So I'm not going to be left behind my rapture curse. There are those who worry about that, say, oh, you know, you believe in Jews, you stay behind and you're the 144,000. <laughs> no. <laughs> God's not limited and he's got a hold of some behind and says you have to stay. No. He raises up a whole new. The people that form the 144,000 are saved after the rapture. Could it be, and I, I hope so, I'm witnessing to Jewish people right now who have not yet come to faith. If the rapture were to occur today, I certainly hope that they're going to say, wow, she was telling me, right, I need to get into that Bible that she believed in, I need to know the truth, and they're going to read of their salvation, they're going to get saved. They may be who are raised up to be one of the 144,000 who God will seal to take the gospel message to the ends of the earth. But no, he doesn't have to hold us back. So I am at, in actuality, even though my nation will receive these promises, I won't in that sense, the same way that the Jewish people from other times are not receiving that, that um, shall Paul right now. We know he's in heaven with the Lord. He said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's not waiting for an earthly home. He's, and we'll see who makes up the people who live on that earthly home in the millennium. We're going to see who they are. Matthew 25 was your hint that I said that tells who goes into the kingdom and who doesn't. But I'm going to leave that character anyway. We want to know from that here. <laughs> but we will see who that group of people is. So my future is in, in the church body because that's the time of age that I am in. From the coming of... Uh, at the Ruch HaKodesh at Acts 2, what we call Pentecost, probably to you, should vote for those of us who knew the, the Jewish piece that was taking place at that time. And that will be completed when it's raptured up, the Holy Spirit taking us back up into heaven. Anyone during that time period, whether they're Jewish or Gentile, we're one in Yeshua, one new man, and our home is the heavenly home. That's our citizenship. That's where we belong. And we will come back and rule and reign with him, whether we're Jewish or Gentile. Okay, but the earthly people that are alive, and here I'm tipping my hand a little bit, but we'll still go into that, uh, that judgment of Matthew 25. But at the time, at the end of the tribulation, and the Lord has returned, and he has stopped the battle of Armageddon, and he's set up his kingdom, and he's going to rule and reign, and we've come back with him, and that's Revelation 19. We will get there. <laughs> it's just a little bit down, but it's coming very closely. We come back to rule reign with him. That's who I'm a part of because that's the day and age that I have been born in. But my Jewishness is not washed away. I'm still recognized in my Jewishness. I didn't stop being Jewish when I accepted the Jewish Messiah. How could accepting the Jewish God make you less Jewish? I still can't comprehend that. You know, it just loses every way you turn around. Jesus was Jewish, so that's my point. You know, that, that's the Jewish God because God the Father in heaven is not nationality. He's, he never took on human form. But Yeshua Jesus took on a human form. He became Jewish. There's no other way to put it. And once you're born, you die. That's just the way it is. Okay, but so I will not be part of the millennial earth dwellers. I will be part of the millennial rulers and reigners. Okay? Okay. Good. Okay. All right. So, we see what Israel is. The church, in contrast, remember, I think I already read it to you, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, a chaste virgin. Remember, he said, I, I betrothed you to present you to 
um, to the father in the chaste version, or you know, to your to your bridegroom, it would be to Yeshua Jesus. Um, let me give you this and just see if it helps a little bit. Go to Isaiah. Isaiah, we know who he's talking to. We know we're talking to the Jewish nation. Isaiah 62, chapter 62. Okay, we're going to see an earthly scene here. Verses 4 and 5. Isaiah 62, verses 4 and 5. Yes. And since you're slow enough for me, I'm going to get it in my complete Jewish Bible too. I like to keep both open, but I have to do both of them separate now, and I don't like to get slowed down. 62, 4, and 5. Okay. Actually, this is just hard Hebrew word, so I'll give it to you in English to save time. In my New American, it will no longer be said to you, and it's talking to Israel, Isaiah the prophet to Israel, okay? It will no longer be said to you, forsaken, no, nor to your land will any longer be said, desolate, that you will be called, my delight is in her, says God, yes. And your land married, and that is, where's that word? Mary Bula, that's right, Bula, I knew that. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. Okay, so we see that Jehovah is concerned about Israel. And he's no longer going to call Israel forsaken or desolate or even not married. Because remember, he's called her a widow, he's called her a harlot, and he's called her a, um, what's my third? What's the third? Widow, harlot, divorce. Divorce, okay? So he's saying, I'm going to call you married because you married to me. Even though you were unfaithful, I kept the marriage. I didn't let go of the contract I made with you, okay? And he's telling her in a way that, that we're going to see in the land. We're going to see the land is no longer desolate. That's what we'll look at when we get into the millennium. Look back at chapter 54, that may help also. Chapter 54, and we're going to look at verses 4 and 5 again. Isaiah 54, 4 and 5. Fear not, for you will not be put to shame. Do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. You'll forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You'll remember no more, for your husband is your maker. God maker whose name is Adonai Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of the whole earth. You see both God the Father and God the Son in these verses, but you know that when we follow the line through, this, when he's speaking as Jehovah, he's calling his wife Israel. There are other places in Scripture also. So when we're talking about the earthly land, we're talking about the people, that's Israel, that's married, uh, or will be again, because right now she's more in a backslidden state, a divorce state, or a harlot state, but we're talking the marriage to Yehovah, where when we're talking about believers today, the believing remnant today is married to the groom, who is Yeshua, who is preparing a place, who is going to come take us to be in his home forever with him. See the difference? Okay, one plan though, God's plan. God's plan is in relation to Israel from beginning to end, you see that? That God has room to be working with different peoples in different ways, and that's nothing strange. We see that on many levels. He works differently with the angels. He works differently with other countries because we see, when we get into the millennium, we're going to see that Egypt is going to lay desolate for a period of time because she's being judged, and yet she's going to raise back up, but she will always be a lowly nation. We see Israel raised up as a head nation. So you see different, it's the, the same way again, I'll take you back to that, um, that uh, family relationship. You have more than one child, you treat the children differently, and not in the wrong way, you love them all the same. They're equal in that way. But you work with them according to who they are, their makeup, and what they're like, and what their likes are. And you do different things with your children accordingly. So it's the same way, okay? But we've got one plan, God's plan, through the ages. And when you want to know his time clock, yes, you look at Israel. Because prophetically, it is all about Israel. And you do see that prior, through, and returning the faithfulness of God. Okay? Yes. Cool. I have a question. 
she comes into her fullness with him because she's finally in that right relationship with him. Because even Romans tells us that Israel will be saved. We know that day is coming. When we come to the millennium, those who enter into the millennium will see are in that right relationship and that's where she'll be called married. He's going to show that he is married to her and he's going to um, bring her into her fullness. Okay? Okay, Tony? Yeah, I so which uh, group, uh, the Messianic Jews, or the church, right. the 24 elders? The 24 elders represent the believers in the church age. So they represent me. They represent you. We're Gentile and Jewish. We're one in the Lord. We're both represented by those 24 elders. Because they're representing. We, we looked at, remember the different... Um, there were several theories of who the 24 elders could represent, and we came to the conclusion that the only one that fit completely was the church body. The church body is made up of Jew and Gentile, but we become one in Yeshua. And it says that we're neither Jewish nor Greek, we're neither free nor slave, we're neither rich nor poor, but we're all brought together. In, in, in essence, what it's saying is there's an equality there. Okay. I'm just... Uh Okay, um, we looked at 24, um, you're moving cobwebs because we're going all the way back to chapter 3, I think okay. it is. Um, but we looked at 24, and there was one time in history that Israel, there's 24 divisions that they had, but we saw that it had to be, this, the elders had to re represent something that was complete, and Israel's not complete. She still isn't. She won't be complete until she comes into her fullness in the millennium when she has accepted her Messiah. Actually, just starting, the, you know, just before it starts the millennium. When she looks on him who, who has been pierced, she sees him and mourns as one mourns for their only son, and in a day, in essence, is saved, because they're going to look up and realize this is their Redeemer. That's when she enters into the fullness of what is hers. I lost what you said now, your 24. question. Oh, the 24. Okay, so Israel what? isn't a complete body yet, so the 24 elders, if they're representing a complete and a totality, and we're going to see again and again um, coming up, we saw a couple times last time, that the 24 elders have the robe of righteousness, they have the crowns, that's given to the church age. That's not given to Israel, that's given to the church age. That's some of our reward. What we get is is the rub of righteousness and the crowns. Yes, I remember back that uh, the throne row. Mm -hmm. The first row is 12, and the second row of it is 12. So this one is first. This one is <coughs> I would need to go back and restudy. I don't even remember it being separated by rows. I'm not arguing that. I'm saying I don't remember. So I'll, let me go back and look at that. I'll table that question for us for next week and bring us the answer. And I'll refresh my mind on the 24. And I'll bring out even again real quickly, if you'd like, why we came to the conclusion that the 24 elders represent the believers. We talked about it last week that the prayers that came up are the prayers that are in their bowls, that they, they have the harps and they have the bowls that are the incense, that that ties it in with us because they're bringing our prayers up into uh, God's presence. Um, we are told, I remember also it's coming back, um, when Yochanan and John asked for an explanation, an angel isn't assigned to explain, one of the elders is assigned to explain, and it's explaining to the people of salvation, and that is those of us who are the body, the believers of Yeshua. So it was even a picture there, I believe, that why did God not have an angel tell him? Because an angel is not saved. An angel did not, the Lord didn't die on the cross for an angel, and the an angel received, but the elder did. So the elder was able to explain to Yochanan John because they're one and the same. The same way that if I want someone to explain to me the Super Bowl, 
I want a, that football play to be explained. <laughs> Let me take it away from me. If you want it explained, are you going to ask Rochelle? <laughs> no. You might go to her brother, or especially her nephew, and get the explanation because they know and understand and they relate. Yes. And if you want to take it all the way, then it's got to be a football player. Uh, neither one of them are. But my point being, if you want to ask something of me, it's going to be something that you know I can explain because I relate. And if you're in a position of need, you're going to go to somebody who has gone through that. Hey, they went through this. They had this problem. Let me go ask them what answer they got because maybe that will help me. You want someone that can understand, relate, who is like you. So the elders coming, or an elder coming to explain to Yochanan is because he's one like Yochanan. And we're going to also see um, more than that, but we have had our last mention of the elders. Um, we're still going to have an angel. We're going to see that it's that angel that's talking from verse 5, why I said, uh, because we may not get to it today. Uh, I'm just going back and saying verse 5 of Revelation 19. The voice coming out of the throne is not the Lord's. It's definitely going to be an angel because we're going to see that Yohanan gets so excited, he wants to fall down and worship. You know, if it was the Lord, he'd allow that. But this one stops him and says, don't, I am your fellow servant. You know, in essence, I'm here to serve you. And we know that's what the angels are for. They are ministering, saint, ministering to the saints who are about to receive salvation. When it says about to receive, that means about to be home, tangibly having it, even though it is ours now. So all the way through we saw it. But I, I will give you a little more clarity real quickly, and I'll go look for it. If there is two rows that I don't remember, I know that some people want to make it 12 Old Testament and 12 New, like the tribes of Israel and uh, then the apostles. But we don't see anywhere where you're allowed to divide it and say, oh, well, 24 is 12 and 12. Well, you know what? It's also 11 and 13. It's also 10 and 14. You know, what gives you the right to just say, oh, because there's 12s in Scripture, I can sit, grab two 12s and say this is the 24. That falls apart with me. Around. Around. That's the way I see it is around. I see one throne lifted up. I love this. I see... God the Father and God the Son on a love seat, made big enough for two. One seat of equality, but they are there on the love seat because they are love. What's the next word I want? They express, they give out. I mean, that's where love begins. They're, they're the essence of love. That's the word I want. Ineffable. <laughs> they're the essence <laughs> of love. That throne is lifted up. It is the highest, and everything is looking up and praising that. And in that praise, around the throne, I see an equal. Just like if we got in a circle, we held hands, and we were around 24 elders that are around that throne that are praising God. They're on. They have thrones also because they have the position of rulership. We see that we get that, but they're lesser thrones. They're not up here on this level. They're down here, and they don't even stand their thrones. They love to get up off of their thrones, and they throw themselves down at the feet of those on the throne lifted up and sing praise and hallelujah and honor and glory and power. And and <sighs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Give me some more words. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So there's your 24 elders. I don't see them in two rows. I see them around. Okay, now I'll go back and look in the Greek, but, uh, because Revelation is in Greek, and I handle it for Revelation, I'll go bring up the Hebrew too, but still. I'll go look at a Hebrew source also. Anyway, point being, I see them around. The four living creatures, I see in between all that, because they're around that throne even closer. And those four living creatures are showing us... <coughs> The glory of God, yes. yeah, in, in different parts, because not one can contain it all. So we've got different parts that are showing us different um, attributes of our God, who is so great. So you have boom, just coming up out of that throne, but on the throne, lifted up, on the highest place. There is the one I can't wait to behold face to face. We will see him. And right next to him is Jehovah the Father. And then the Spirit is what's permeating through because the Spirit is what's felt and palpable and, and, and isn't contained. I, I can't do it. It's not just the Spirit. Uh, what Tony was asking, if one of the twelve, a group of two twelves, is the apostle, 
then John was looking at himself. He could have wondered, why am I there? You know? That's a good point. That's a good point. I never thought about that. But yes, he would have had to seen himself and say, oh, that's me, but I'm here. <laughs> so, good point. I like that. Okay. All right. I think we've got, are we good? Are you there? Do you see it? Do you feel it? Yes. Can you hardly wait? <laughs> Come on, Lord. <laughs> Let me give you also, oh, it is, it is, and it will overwhelm you, but if you're like me, you just feel the flood of his joy, and it just bubbles up, and you just want to explode, and that's what you're seeing. I'm trying to keep the lid on it so I can keep teaching, but I want to just shout hallelujah, and I want to say, take me home now, and I want to say, let me see like John saw, Lord, open my eyes that I can see, because for me, it's in my mind's eye, but remember, Yochanan was caught up. Yes. He saw it, and he saw it in, in reality. That's why it blew his mind. How do you describe, when you're a, a 95 AD person, how do you describe 2019 technology? Wow, he did a great job, but it, 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 he had to just, wow. <laughs> you know, well, isn't that what we're doing with God? We're trying to wrap our minds around it, and we can't. But how beautiful. And to know that we are his bride. To know that we belong. To know that we have a home, and it is ours forever. In his presence forever. Because remember when he catches us up, he says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, Exactly. You cannot. You cannot. And you couldn't ever leave that. That, again, tells me the depth of the love of the Lord, that he could leave the glory of heaven to come down to earth, sin-soaked earth. I need another S. <laughs> sin-soaked whatever. I mean, he didn't come to a perfect place. He came knowing that he was going to be mistreated, not believed. He was going to suffer at their hands. He was going to suffer even greater because when he is, is in the um, depths of agony in Gethsemane, I don't believe it was because of the torture his physical body would endure which is bad enough. I can't even watch the passion, folks. It's bad enough. I don't limit that. But I think what was breaking his heart that brought him to the point that physically he shed drops of blood was the fact that he was going to become the sin sacrifice. He was going to take on sin. This is our holy God. You know, the closer we get to God, the more sin bothers us. The more it, it, it pricks us, the more we can't stand and we feel like we're living in a cesspool. Well, now take the holiness of God. And he was willing to confine himself, first and foremost. God, who is free to be everywhere, throughout all of creation, that he created over it all, under it all, carrying it all, keeping it all, being all. Whoa. And now he's going to confine himself to human flesh, where he's in one place at a time. Wow. And then he's going to take on that human nature. Now remember, he is born sinless. That's why it had to be the virgin birth, because he could not, the sin line could not come through, or then he would have to die for himself. But staying fully God, being virgin born, so that he did not have the sin nature within him, yet he was going to take on and be the sin sacrifice. And that sin would be, in essence, transferred on him. And he knew at that moment that he became the sin sacrifice. What did God do? Turn his back. This is God the Father, God the Son, are sitting on the throne together today. These are the ones who have never been separated through all of eternity, all the way past. They have been together. You know how much you love a mate that you've been with, or a parent, or a child, and you lose them at 50, 60, 70 years, and you almost can't stand the separation and the loneliness? He knew all of this, and he still chose to do this. This is 
ineffable. <laughs> we can't, but that's what, for him to know he was going to, in essence, dip himself in sin, be that sin sacrifice, the holiness. It, he had to abhor himself and then know he is going to be separated from his God, and he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama is the bachlami. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know what he has promised you and I? Never to feel that. Never to know that. He alone <coughs> knew that in a moment of time. And still, willingly came, willingly went through it, willingly laid down his life, willingly paid the price. Oh, my God, is such love. I am just. This is where I just want to fall on my face and just, just my lips are unclean. I can't speak of the holiness of my God. I'm not worthy. And I just bow in humbleness before him and just say, thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you. And then I feel it. I want to shout the praise and the hallelujah and the glory because he's God. And he did this for me when I didn't deserve it. And I never could deserve it. And I can see, I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional, you guys, but it's touching me to that point. I feel it and I just had to let my heart cry out. Michelle, if I may say, you know, the passion of the Christ uh, was not even close to what the Lord went, it really through. went through. And yet, I am grateful for that for that director that showed us the ex not even the extent, but the the, the human uh, eye could see something that you know that, that the Lord went through. Because yes. you always see a, a, a Jesus on the cross that has nothing really, he's not hurting, he's and physically, you can't really see. He showed us the pain. Uh, I mean, it was uh, amazing. It was hard for me to see, but it showed me how how much more, how the Lord went through. Yeah, and when you see it, it does bring it home. And I didn't mean to not recommend it. I'm just saying I'm so sensitive, my heart gets ripped out. I'm the little girl that when the stories were on at resurrection time, when it got near the crucifixion, I ran out of the room, I couldn't watch it. You know, but especially for those who really need to see it, really need to understand and know the price that he paid. You know, I just, and then there's nothing I can't do for my God to say thank you. There's nothing. There's nothing. I mean, let me do everything I can. Let me move heaven on earth. Let me share it. Let me talk it. Let me tell it. Let me bring others. And let me show you. You know, whatever you want, God, I'm yours. <laughs> I'm yours. It's nothing. It's, just, it's not even worthy of being called a down payment on what he did. I have nothing worth. That's why I say I'm so thankful that we're given crowns. Because at least I'll have something I can hand back yes. to him and say, you're the one. Put it on, yes. Lord. Wear the crown. Yes. Put it on the million crowns and let us all say hallelujah. hallelujah. Let us all praise you. Let us sing those praises. And when we hear it reverberating from every corner, from everywhere, then maybe, maybe we're beginning to give him what's his due. Maybe. 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 <laughs> No. no, but we'll be taken out of this earthly and we'll be brought into the heavenly where we have that new body, where we are able to be more like him because it says we'll have his mind in us. Still, still, the awesomeness, the awesomeness. He belongs on that throne. He belongs high and lifted up. Hallelujah. Let me get through the rest of my thought here. I don't want to bring us down, but let me get through to complete this thought, and we'll stop. We're going to sit in verse 7. <laughs> Sorry, but I warn you all, we're never in a hurry. That means there's no way we're getting home again today. Thank God. I don't want to be there today. Not after this highlight. You know, we and we need this. We really need it because... This world is not our home. And we need to sometimes be brought up into that presence. And we need to be reminded of the high cost of our salvation. That we not just take it unworthily. That we don't respect it. That we don't 
do what we can to, to be his servants. So it's, it's a good, even though I know I'm preaching to the choir, I know you're with me and I see it in all your faces, it's still, we need to be there sometimes. We just need to, to just let our minds try to wrap around with this. Yes. 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 That there is something much greater. Yes. Yes, exactly. And that's why I'm so thankful. I've never seen it so much as when I've taught through it this time, where God just continually, we get a little bit of the, the horrors and, and the, the evilness, and then he lifts us back up. And then he shows us a little bit more, but then he lifts us back up. And I just so appreciate that of it's him. Love. It is. It's his love. And when you remember that this book, and this book alone, out of all the scripture, out of the 66 books, this book alone gives us the fullness of him in his glory, his return in his glory, who he is in his glory, and seeing him in his glory. I am so thankful for this book. And remember I brought out prophecy earlier today and how key prophecy is because the spirit, and we're going to read it, that the spirit of prophecy is Yeshua, it's Jesus. And then we remember the name of this book, because everybody says, oh, you're studying prophecy. Yeah, that's true. But we're studying more than just the four coming events. We're studying what is the spirit of prophecy, which is Yeshua, Jesus. And that's why the very first verse of this book is the revelation, the unveiling, the revealing of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Jesus the Messiah. That's the whole sum of the book in its first four words. And we're going to keep coming back to that and keep coming back to that and keep coming back to that, especially as we come up through our latter chapters and see it. It's like the, the gift has been given to us and the bow has been tied and it's been tied in the glory of Yeshua. It's the Shekhinah glory that ties it all together. And we revel in the revelation of our Lord and our Savior in Yes, glory. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are thrilled he came first time. He had to come first time. We couldn't have the second without the first. But the first he came suffering. He came servant. He came lowly. And he came to become sin sacrifice. The second time he comes. And we, I thought we are going to get some of it. We're going to see heaven open up and we're going to see him come out. And you're going to be doing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes. If you don't think you're Pentecostal, you're going to be in my class. <laughs> because how can you not be? You see him coming in his glory. He's not coming humble, lowly, riding on the donkey. He's not coming to suffer. He is coming faithful and true. King of kings, Lord of lords. I get all of these words to be telling you about. But it's going to be a great class next week. Keep coming. The best is yet to be. But thank God for the revelation of him. Thank God we get the final chapter. Thank God I can peek and read the end and I know he wins. Amen. And because he wins, we, we win. win. Hallelujah. 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 See, you're all the time to thought because we're past time. You know what? Maybe I won't because I don't want to rush through it. What I'll bring out to you next week is we're looking at that typology. I brought out to you that the bride belongs to Yeshua Jesus. The wife belongs to Jehovah. And this might even help with your question where the word of the Messianics belong. And I think I've, I've given that to you. But we're going to see in this typology that the bride given to, the, to Yeshua Jesus is a Gentile bride. Now that doesn't mean that I can't fit in because I'm Jewish. It doesn't mean that at all. But we're going to look at it in scripture and see in typology. And typology is a type that expresses something more heavenly. We're going to see that it was a Gentile bride that was brought to the sun. I'll show it to you with, with several different characteristics, uh, characters, Bible characters. I'll show it to you with different Bible characters. And then I will show you also that uh, the difference with Israel being married, wife to Jehovah. So we'll look at that. That's where we'll open up in class. We're going to see that the bride, that's us, that she's made herself ready. How we made ourselves ready? Have we come through that mikvah? And what does it mean on the other side? How are we made ready? And why do we see that in this chapter? We're going to see we are ready. We are beautiful. The bride is to be beautiful, even though this is all about the lamb. So we'll look at that. Um, we'll look at... Uh, how she's ready. We'll look at who is at the marriage supper. Because we got a supper. 
We've got people at a supper. You don't put on a supper without people, but we have different people. So who's the guests? Who's, are we? No, <laughs> no we're not. <laughs> we've got the bride and groom, we've got the guests. We'll look at all of that. We'll see um, heaven open up. Ooh, I can't wait till we get to that. And then if we get that far, that means for the whole class. Then we may, we'll, we'll crash down just a little bit to go into the Battle of Armageddon. And I will show you, like I say, from all the, the different chapters. I'll bring that all together for you. And we will see the victory that comes out of the end of the tribulation, out of the Battle of Armageddon, because that's what the return of our Messiah in his glory. And we will see that. That By the time we get through all that, they were through with 19, and we're ready to go into the millennium. So even though we're moving very slowly, we're actually covering a lot of ground. We're covering so much in Scripture. You, you just can't rush through it. So. Don't rush through it, because I'll be on vacation. <laughs> I want to be here. <laughs> well, you don't know. Well, Roger might yeah, that might be, we might be all ready. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Do I, have I left any questions on the table? Is there anything you need to answer so you don't go out for a week in confusion? God forbid. <laughs> okay, we're good? Are we looking forward to the next class? Yes. Yes. Want it now? <laughs> 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 Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's close in prayer so anyone who needs a vaccine can go. Volunteer or shall I do it? I'll do it. Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. We praise your holy name. You are Melch. You are King. You are Jehovah. You are our provider. You are El Shaddai, Almighty God. You are awesome and amazing. You are Yeshua, Jesus. You are the Lamb of God. And thankfully, we are your bride. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And as the bride awaits the time of your return, which we believe to be so imminent, Lord God, take us out safely to do your work. Let us show you our joy of our salvation by working for you. Show us opportunities this week, Lord, to tangibly be your hands and feet on this earth while we await the time that you bring us home to be with you forever and ever. Thank you for loving us when we were not lovely. Thank you that you are unconditionally in love with us. And Lord God, we just want to be head over heels in love with you, bowing at your feet, shouting out the hallelujahs of praise and thanking you that our salvation is procured for ever. Thank you, Lord. And in that power, the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, may we go forth now serving you in the time that's left till you call us home. Praise you forever and ever and ever and ever. And together we say amen. amen. Let it be and hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah.